afternoon, everyone, and welcome once again to Pew and Beyond. This is our first Pew and Beyond of May, and uh, we're really excited to be with you today. And uh, for the next couple of weeks, uh, we're going to be thinking about prayer and different ways of encouraging prayer, engaging with prayer, um, praying together, praying on our own, praying as parishioners, and how prayer really makes such a difference to us in our faith communities and in our wider communities. So welcome to Pew and Beyond. And as always, we welcome your participation. For those of you who are watching us on Facebook Live, we value your comments, your thoughts, your ideas, and we certainly welcome you to involve yourself in the community today. Uh, so as I said earlier, uh, do uh, say hello, tell us where you're from, and tell us what prayer looks like in your context. And as we go along, we want to hear some of the stories you might tell. And my name is Neil Mancor. I'm the Congregational Development Coordinator for the Diocese of Montreal. And I'm here today with my colleague. I'm Lisa Vaughn, the Parish Vitality Coordinator with the Diocese of Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. And before I introduce our special guests, I want to acknowledge that we share this land across the country with peoples who came before us, our Indigenous brothers and sisters. We continue to work for healing and reconciliation, and we are mindful of the stewardship of the earth, this of God's creation. Pew and Beyond is an initiative of the Spiritual Formation for Discipleship Network of the Anglican Church of Canada. And as Neil said, we are focusing on prayer today. and We're delighted to have two guests from the East Coast, Reverend Cherry Workman, who is the rector and priest at the parish of South Queens in Nova Scotia. That's on the south shore of Nova Scotia near Liverpool and in Liverpool. And then we have Reverend Gloria Wendover, who is in the parish of Hearts Content. Isn't that beautiful? Hearts Content, Newfoundland, which is in the Diocese of Eastern Newfoundland and Labrador. And um, just probably about almost two hours drive from St. John's, just to kind of situate the beautiful community of Hearts Content. So welcome to you both. Great to have you here. Nice and we want your parish, that's for sure. Hearts Content. We're all coming. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds Trinity absolutely Bay. wonderful. Pardon? Trinity Bay. Trinity We're Bay. Bay. <laughs> Trinity, before... the Trinity. Wonderful. Oh, that's oh right. well, yes. <laughs> Before we get started, I want to greet a few people. Betty Mansfield from Cape Breton is here, and Ooh. Wendy Newman from Hamilton, Christchurch Cathedral. Welcome. Rachel Parker from Wainwright, Alberta. Jeffrey from Dawson City up in the Yukon. Comes every week. Jeffrey, it's great to see you. And um, Susan from Red Deer, Alberta. She actually already has a comment. She says, part of our prayer team in my church, they meet every week on Zoom to pray for our parishioners and others. So already we're getting some really good comments and those are exactly what we want to hear. Betty Mansfield, Valerie Bennett and Carol Mancor is also watching. Welcome to you all. Wonderful. I thought maybe we could start today with uh, Reverend Cherry. She's in again the parish of South Queens and Cherry just launched um, a huge prayer caravan, a prayer initiative in her parish and I'm wondering um, what, what could you tell us about that, Cherry? How did you get started on a prayer caravan for your community? Well, this prayer caravan or prayer journey by prayer, as we called it, came about as a result of Trinity Churches. Uh, Trinity Church is in Liverpool. And it came about as a result of Trinity Church's 200 year celebration. And we wanted to do something uh, to celebrate in this pandemic time to be a part of the community, to be visible in the community as we were celebrating. And so one of our, our laity came up with the idea of having a, a prayer, it was supposed to be a prayer walk initially, but we decided we were going to be covering too much ground to just have a prayer walk, so a prayer journey by prayer. And so with that uh, idea was passed through the anniversary committee and then she was take, uh, given the, in, the encouragement to uh, come up with places that we wanted to pray for and pray at. And so she took that on and there were all kinds of things that went into that planning. And uh, I'm not sure if you would wish me to continue saying more about that or Yes, tell us where did what like what, what kind of shape did it take? So people were going in their vehicles and, and where did you go? So yes, there were about 15 of us and we we met at various places, a variety of places across 
uh, town of Liverpool, uh, beginning with the municipal building. And the municipal building was where we prayed for political leaders of, of um, all levels. And we were also near Trinity's main cemetery now. And so we were praying for those who have gone before as well. And then we went to the Nova Scotia Native Council, to the town well, where uh, water is free and many people come to collect their water. And at that place, while we were praying, we were praying for um, a former uh, St. Andrew's Chapel that was also an Anglican um, presence in the community. And we also prayed for firefighters at that place because uh, we were very near the fire department. Um, we prayed at the center of town in a parking lot that is between and near other churches. So we prayed for the ecumenical community at that place. And we also prayed for the local food bank there. We then drove to the Lane's, um, Lane's Restaurant and Inn that parking place and we prayed there for hosp the hospitality industry. And also we are very near a fish plant and we're right on the ocean here. So fishing is uh, a huge part of, of um, what makes up Liverpool here. We're very dependent on the fishing industry. And so we were praying for the fishing industry and the fish plant while we were there. We then went to the Queens and Mara Center and the Queens and Mayor Center, um, there are people gather for sports and recreation, for, for leisure, for, for well-being. And uh, we prayed for, for that while we were there, for the center itself, but for also for health and well-being and for all that goes on there, friendships that are made there. And we went to a school. So we prayed for teachers and students. And we went to um, the Queens Manor parking lot in the Queens Manor is a long-term care home here. So while we were there, we were praying not only for the residents, but also for the staff, the doctors and nurses, all that helped to make the nursing home what it is. And we also prayed there for um, the Queens General Hospital, which we also have in our area. So we were praying as well for the doctors and nurses and all the staff that make up the hospital, but also for the patients who are in that hospital. And we actually ended our, our prayer time at the RCMP station. So we, we covered a, a variety of places and people and organizations while we were on this um, prayer journey. That's great. Thanks, Cherry. I'm going to come back in a minute, but I also know that Gloria has been doing some prayer mm -hmm. walks in her neighborhood. What kinds of things are you doing, Gloria? Uh, we do a weekly prayer walk. And uh, when I started, it was, you know, two or three and probably four or five. But of course, since uh, COVID now, and uh, when we were in different alert levels, of course, we did space ourselves, but then it ended up just being me, you know, when we were in alert level five. So we go for an hour, usually uh, meet at at the church well we only have one church left now when i came here four years ago there was three churches now there's only one so we you know meet at the church and uh, many weeks you know could be just me or one person or two or three but um so then we walk around the community we have an opening prayer of thanksgiving to god and then we have a prayer in the middle of our walk and I usually use the prayer in our Book of Alternative Services for the mid-prayer, the uh, response of intercession. And we pray for people in the community, those who are living alone, those who are struggling. Uh, we also have a personal care home in, our, in our, one of our towns and a school. And so we pray for all the people that work there. We have a couple of stores. Well, actually one store closed. We only have one community now with a store. There's th three communities in my parish and uh, we walk along and midway, that's when we do the prayer, uh, prayers for the people in the communities and for their families abroad. And we pray for the world, for our healthcare leaders and our provincial leaders, our municipal leaders, our church leaders, all leaders. And so then um, 
at the end, we, we, we go throughout the community. Then at the end, we go back to where we started. And then we have a closing prayer. And we end that uh, with the Lord's Prayer. When uh, last summer, uh, there wasn't many with me, I, I walk in each community. I try to walk there once a week. But one day a week, Tuesday or Wednesday, is a community prayer walk. But then when I wasn't on the community prayer walk uh, last year, we have a lot of seniors. So uh, I would go and knock on their doors and say hello, talk to them from their doorstep and have a little prayer with them right on the doorstep. And that was all checked out with the bishop. And it's amazing the response of how thankful people are and what, how they've been blessed uh, through the prayers. But not only have they been blessed, we who pray for them, because we have a confidential prayer chain in our parish as well, we've all been so blessed and our parish has been blessed. It's just amazing. So, so that's always the, the big question. I think when whenever we're involved in something in ministry is the why. Um, because um, I'm, I'm sure there are lots of people in our neighborhoods who would say, why would you bother to pray, first of all? And why would you bother to do all of that, make all that effort? gather all those people and go out and walk around the neighborhood or drive around the neighborhood and pray. Like, so what's your why? <laughs> well, Lisa, I learned at a very young age that there was a lot of power in prayer. I remember when I was eight years old, my grandfather died. It was on a Saturday morning, a rainy Saturday, October morning in Newfoundland, you know, rain, drizzle and fog. And, uh, when I found out that my grandfather had died, he lived right next door to me. When I left, I went down and when I left the house, the first thing I did at eight years old was to come back in my home, go to my bedroom, kneel down and ask God to protect my grandmother because there were eight children in the house. But I knew that God, if I prayed, that God would answer my prayers. And I learned that from the people in my community. I didn't grow up Anglican. I grew up in the United Church. And I went to the Salvation Army, the Pentecost. I went to a seven-day Adventist with my friends. And uh, then when I met my late husband, he was Anglican. So there I was. <laughs> so I had quite a variety. But I learned from the people in my community mostly the seniors and my clergy as well. Got to give the clergy credit. But the seniors, it was the people in my community, I think. I saw the faith that they had. I saw the faith that sustained them. And I used to hear them say, you know, they spend so much time on their knees, you know. And, and I learned that at a very, very young age. And I learned to trust in God. And uh, yeah, so I never asked the question, why? Like I would ask the question, why wouldn't I? There is so much power. I've seen it. I had a prayer answered once right away. And even me with as much faith that I have and trust in God and belief in answer to prayer, I was shocked when my prayer was answered right away. So I have to pray for people because if I don't, I think I'm taking something away from them because a prayer is a communication with God, talking with them. We can talk to them anywhere. We can pray anywhere. So why not? <laughs> why not? The most powerful force in the universe. Why not? I love that you, the way you said, yeah. if I don't pray for people, I'm taking something away from them. Wow, yeah. I really do believe that. Cherry, what's your why? Oh my, there are many. I agree with Gloria, there's power in prayer and I can tell some stories about that and have to well as I continue on. Um, I also think that the why is just a natural outflow of our relationship with Christ. And, and we just had this scripture on Sunday about abiding in Christ and I think that as we do abide in Christ that, uh, and communicate with him, with God, 
that, I mean, prayer obviously is just this natural outflow that comes to our communion. And it, it comes because we, in what God gives us, we want to give something back. So we, we talk, we communicate, we give thanksgiving, we offer thanksgiving and um, confession. We ask for forgiveness. Um, there's just all types of reasons that we, that we come to pray to God. And it is this faithfulness of God that we see. Um, I think too, the power, the faithfulness comes together. So that continues us to want to continue to communicate with God. And part of the reason is our own self. So it's not just God, but it's our, from our own relationship with God. We, we want to pray. We are, uh, I think, gifted to pray. And that just continues. It deepens as we grow in that relationship. Our prayer, our time with God um, in prayer, I think, is much richer for that. And like Gloria, she said that she's seen people praying and learned growing up about the power of prayer. And that certainly was obvious in my family as well. My, seeing my father kneeling at the bedside was you know, one of those humbling experiences to know that my father was praying, my, my parents prayed, my grandparents. And when I was a little bit older, um, still a very young adult, I was diagnosed with uh, malignant melanoma and um, in a week was sent off to the Dixon Center, which is a plant's place for cancer patients. And um, during that week, I, I, many people were praying for me, myself included. Um, and a week later, as I arrived at the hospital and met up with the doctor, he didn't seem concerned at all. In fact, there were, I was there with my friends and um, he had to just determine which one of us was the one there to be, to be um, well treated or to be in discussion with. And, uh, when he said it, when he learned it was me, he said, well, I'm just going to get a cough, I'll be right back, but we think things are okay with you. So upon meeting with him, it was determined that I, in fact, did not have malignant melanoma, but it was a benign form. And yes, perhaps there was a misdiagnosis, perhaps. But I also believe that there's power in prayer. And if nothing else, that power in prayer transformed me. Um, and strengthen my relationship in Christ. So that in itself was, was huge and a huge part of the step that brought me to this place today. So wonderful stories. We want to hear from you, though, as well, those of you in our audience today, stories about prayer, as well as neighborhood prayer walks and the power of prayer. Martha, Whitaker says neighborhood prayer walks are part of their practice with their youth group. They also have a Lexio Divina group that meets twice weekly, which is great. And Catherine says, uh, Catherine Morgan comments, our Good Friday service this year, instead of walking and praying at each church, we prayed for our community and essential workers uh, on the walk. So the prayer stations, I'm just trying to open this up here. We're at the uh, seniors apartments medical clinic, community care support services in downtown to pray for our vulnerable community members. So like you say, bringing the power of prayer into these places. Um, Sometimes on, on Pew and Beyond, we talk about what are, what's the spiritual fruit and, and it connects with the why obviously, but I'm wondering um, for, for both Cherry and, and for Gloria, what's the spiritual fruit that's born by those who are, first of all, those who are in the parish, um, what kinds of things are they gaining from being involved? I mean, gee, Cherry, to have 15 people from your parish come out to a parish caravan for what, a couple of hours? Um, that's a big commitment it's amazing so there must be something that that they are uh, valuing in that can you both share a little bit about what what your parishioners are receiving well, well i can say that um i do know that there were comments after this two hour it was a, it was about a two hour prayer journey by car that we did 
And I know that those who were uh, involved, some, some couldn't really put their finger on what they wanted to say, but they knew that they were touched and moved by the experience. And that has come back to me that there was, um, that the words of the prayers, that, that the places we are at, I think they were connecting into more deeply into the community of which they are a part. And through prayer, I, I believe that, you know, they realize that what's on their heart and they, their involvement in the community, it greatly connected what what they're thinking, what they would like to see done and the prayer that's um, that is occurring is also joining us into what's already what God's already doing in the yeah. community. So I think that um, I think that will it, it will encourage us to continue in our um, works of faith to be involved in the community outside the church. So I think those kind of things are, are really helpful. Um, as we pray, we pray without ceasing. I think when we when we start our prayer and it, it you know comes from the heart, then that, that just falls with works of faith, and that's a way of praying without ceasing. It's it's just the everything flows from that. Yeah. Gloria. I think people are realizing, and uh, you know, a few have mentioned realizing that they have a part to play in Jesus' mission to the world. And it may not seem like much to walk through the community and pray, but in actual fact, people's lives are being touched. And people are feeling some kind of a peace because they know that we're into the community praying for them. And just the fact of people driving by, like when we're standing there at the beginning and midway and at the end, you know, and uh, if they pass by and I see them, even when we're walking, I'll say, oh, good morning. We're out on our prayer walk this morning. You know, would you like, is there anything you need, you know, uh, would you like us to pray for you or like, I remember the first day that uh, we started the prayer walk, we had a gentleman, uh, one of our parishioners who was going to be going the next day for surgery. And we went into his house, I think it was probably five of us. And we stood around and we prayed for him. And he was so grateful. And so was his wife. Like those kinds of things, like it may seem like something small, but but it makes it makes a huge difference. And we're realizing that yes, what we can do is is important, very important. And the lay people. They do certainly have a role. You know, Jesus called fisher people, didn't he? Mm -hmm. We have lots of those fisher people here in Newfoundland. And I and I guess, Cherry, you, you as well. Yeah, we have a fish plant actually in one of our communities as well. So, you know, I think they're realizing, yeah, Jesus did call me. You know, I'm an ordinary person, but, you know, Jesus used ordinary people, you know? And not only that, I think it's encouraging others to pray for people that, you know, they wouldn't normally be praying for and, and to realize. And it, I think it's opening people's minds up to prayer. Because, you know, I used to often hear people say, oh, my goodness, I can't pray. Sure, I don't know how to pray. You know, and I, and I say to them, well, you're, it's a conversation. It's a conversation with God. You know, I tell them, I use the acronym, as the Christian, I pray. Adoration, thanksgiving, confession. We always got to confess. I, have, I tell them I have more confessions than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then your intercessions and our petitions, right? As the Christian, I pray. And uh, it's just a conversation and you can talk with God. I, I say to people, if you only knew who, that I was praying for you when I'm walking through the community, 
or in the bank or in the supermarket, you know, in, in a line of, wow, I think it's wonderful. Yes, prayer is often something we do. It's something that we can do when there's, we don't know what else there is to do at the time, right? And so it's a gift in itself. And often that prayer will lead us to know if there is something else we can do. Yeah. yeah. That discernment part, that listening to God. Yeah. Yes. And maybe there'll be a tap on the shoulder. <laughs> yes. And I think the more open we are about talk, you know, about talking about that. Like I have three sons and they went to church every Sunday, but like every other teenager, when they got confirmed, they didn't want to go to church. So after 14 or 15, they didn't go to church. But boy, I'll tell you, if they had an exam or one of their buddies was in trouble, and even now, you know, my sons are uh, 37, 40, and 43. Just a month ago, my son called me from Alberta. Mom, you got to pray for so-and-so. He just fell so many feet off the scaffold. He's gone to the hospital in an ambulance. Don't know if he's going to make it. My son in Ontario, mom, my neighbor next door, he just, they just rushed him to the hospital, pray for him. You know, all this kind of thing. Like, and other people, like our Facebook page, like people message me privately or they'll call and, you know, ask for those prayers. Like, I think we need to be talking about prayer more because it's a conversation like we're having here now, you know? And I'll tell you, the Lord gets tired. I think he does hearing me. <laughs> but, but I give him lots of prayers of thanks. So, and we don't have to say anything necessarily for it's the true. prayer. It can be silent. It groans, right? Sighs. It's, if, if we're uh, joining God into that, that that's a prayer. Mm. So. And I'm sure during the pandemic, there were a few sighs of prayer. <laughs> Sometimes Boy. we run out of words during... <laughs> crisis like this yeah yeah nancy beale says i'm blessed with a handful of confidential prayer partners that she can call upon who've been a real source of strength it's true isn't it do we yeah. need that and then betty mansfield says i would love to do prayer walks in our community they've been doing compline on facebook live five nights a week both of which are good but i think it's interesting to think about so people wanted to uh, take prayer out into the community because what I love about this this conversation it kind of brings together two passions that we have here in Pew and Beyond one of which is for prayer and for that spirituality because you know prayer is the hope of the church um, uh, at the same time it's connecting with our community that's the other hope of the church and you're kind of doing that you're bringing those two things together in what you're doing so what would you say to people who say we'd love to do this in our community Yes, go for, go for it. I would say, well, get with it, start it, just announce it in church, get a few people together and just decide what day you're going to, what time and have it publicized and try it. We never know, should not be afraid to try anything but uh, have a particular day, a particular time. Uh, have some prayers ready, typed out, you know, in case, uh, you know, we do use uh, written prayers, but, uh, but then, of course, I also pray lots of prayers from the heart, but just to be organized and let people know, well-informed, and, uh, yeah, encourage people and let them know that, no, there's no particular way to pray, but it's important, yes, to give God our praise and to ask for, you know, his forgiveness and to pray for other people and to pray for ourselves. And, but yes, give it a try. Sherry? Yeah, yes, I mean, I, I agree with, with what Gloria said. In our case, is we just organized this uh, two hour walk or journey by car. Um, we had the, the person who was uh, taking care of this, a chair of this, of this journey by car. She came up with the places that we were going to play at. And she also uh, contacted those places to let them know that we would be going to their area in their parking lots, wherever it might be. So then they were aware that we were coming there as well. We had in fact, the mayor and the MLA from the area joined us nice. when we were at the 
the municipal building parking lot. Um, we also had it announced in our local radio station. And I actually had the privilege of hearing it uh, being, being advertised. And it was really nice that he just didn't um, sort of put it all in one little lump. He went through point by point the places where we'd be praying and then ended with all good stuff. So I thought, wow, this, you know, he knows about this too. Now our listeners know about it. And even though we didn't have others joining in, uh, they were aware that we were out there praying at these places uh, for people, for the organization and events that are happening in our area. So I think that was all a positive thing. And yes, we also had our prayers typed up uh, so that those who were with us could participate. They were praying. Um, anyone, actually everyone had the opportunity to say a prayer on this prayer walk that was with us. Um, I love the um, the sign of of you folks being in the community, the sign of Christ, the sign that that the church cares, that that witness is really, I think, important, especially as you know, there are a lot of people who think the church just wants money or, you know, is a bureaucracy. And yet here are these folks praying for business and schools and and people in their homes who are going through difficult times. And they think, what a wonderful witness of Christ, uh, that light of Christ um, in, in the neighborhood where there's probably a lot of folks who are you know, wondering, does anybody care? And here are these folks uh, praying uh, and caring. Um, and sometimes that's all we can offer and sometimes it's more, but I think it's so, it's so powerful. What a, what, what a wonderful witness. Yeah, I think prayer is a glue that holds together a relationship with God and God with his people, right? I think what we were doing was part of that glue. And so people were able to see that. We had our little cross with us. Someone was a cross bearer while we were there standing in our respective places. A cross was always pulled out of the trunk of a car and we were, someone was there holding it for us. So. People knew it was the church that was out there praying for them. We do the, uh, as a lot of communities do, the, the walk with the cross on Good Friday. And, uh, you know, people took their horns as, they, as they're going or wave. And uh, when we start uh, this year and, and last year as well, that we started um, at the beginning of each community and, and walk through and... Uh, at the beginning of our community in the first house is a, is a lady um, in one of the communities and she's having treatment, you know, for cancer. And uh, it's a cancer that can't be cured, but she has to have treatment. And, uh, you know, a young mother, well, a young grandmother. And so we had the blessing of having a prayer with her at the beginning of our walk, you know, with the cross. Two Good Fridays now in a row. And uh, I mean, she's not a member of our congregation, but she's a member of our community mm -hmm. and we're all one, you know, and, and it doesn't matter like if they come to our church or not, you know, or if they go right. or if they come to any church, you know, they're a child of God and we were all created by him to be in relationship with him and one another. So the prayer, I think, uh, like you said, Lisa, you know, it gels us together, right? It connects us. It really does connect us, doesn't it? Yeah. We've got some lovely stories. Um, first of all, I want to say hi to Martin from Vancouver, who's watching. Nice to see you, Martin. Catherine tells a story. She says 10 years ago, she had major surgery uh, for cancer. And after the surgery, the surgeon mentioned several times how well it went and how well she had done that her system had sort of cooperated very well and afterwards she found out that uh, four friends from a bible study group gathered in prayer throughout the time of the surgery and held her up in prayer you know that's kind of those beautiful stories but i've got a question as well and lynn uzens as well talks about the importance of deep listening to god in scripture and in prayer to get those nudges about people we might need to call or visit or pray for um, but Linda Cass-Jones, I think is a really good question. She says, having been trained 
Having been a trainer in pastoral care, one of the most uncomfortable piece for participants was praying for each other in real time. I know what you mean. You know, that sort of when you get beyond the written prayer and we're going to actually do this face to face. Um, she says that was short lived, but it was new to a lot of people. So how do we often um, help people sort of gain comfort and confidence with praying with each other together? I think just as we did with this prayer group, with the prayers typed out for one, if the prayer is there and they have something to begin um, to pray from, that, that, that starts to give them a comfort that they can then uh, pray, you know, as, as they are so moved. But I think there's a starting place for all of us. I'm not that comfortable with prayer always, but um, I've certainly become much more comfortable and I do pray and feel called to pray often. Uh, and those nudges that Lynn Uzanth was talking about, um, they're not only to go somewhere necessarily, but they can be also to pray for, for someone. So uh, I, I heard those nudges as well. So I think we just have to have people um, start it and offer them, not push them, but offer them, encourage them. And I think that people will become comfortable. That, that call is, I think that that urge is there for us to do that. And if they're not comfortable with speaking, well, then they can say a silent prayer. And by all means, you know, I encourage people, you know, and then when you've said your silent prayer, just say, Amen. Mm. You know, Jesus spent lots of time alone by himself. And sometimes the most, most enriching times in our, within our spirits is when we are sitting by a lake or, you know, sitting alone in our living room or wherever, you know. Um, I know a friend of mine one time, um, her son, their only son that had been killed in a, in a car accident. And I spent uh, many hours sitting with them in quiet and uh, sometimes I was praying quietly in my mind but more times I was just sitting in quiet and I was just being you know be still and know that I am God yes and and I think we have to respect what other people are comfortable in and what they're not comfortable with because there is no particular way there's different forms of prayer, you know, the adoration, thanksgiving, confession, intercessions, and petitions, but there's no particular words we have to use. I mean, and when we don't have the words, scripture tells us the spirit groans for us. Isn't that wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. So we have to respect one another, hey. Yes, and I think we pray more often than we realize. You know, if we, if we begin, if we stop and think about it, we, I think sometimes we complicate things. Um, when yes. we prayer and often we're praying anyway and just just those little uh, arrow prayers or um, you know prayers of thanksgiving just three words four words those, those are prayers and often we may not realize that but maybe if we point those things out that they're prayer then people will realize they really are praying and yeah, like, thank you, Lord, for the beautiful day. Like, I, I realized since uh, this pandemic that a lot of people in, in the communities that, that I'm ministering in is that uh, people are being expressing, they're being more expressive about what they have to be thankful for. You know, they're really, uh, and I, it's wonderful. And I think it's giving hope. And it's uh, keeping negativity away and it's giving them peace. And we're all encouraging one another, you know, in talking, but in actual fact, it's a form of prayer. Absolutely. I just think as well, you know, praying just the prayers of our hearts are often very quiet. And um, I remember I didn't even, uh, when we were, uh, well, we had to buy a house when I changed jobs. We'd always lived in rectories and then I worked for the diocese. So we were, had never bought a house before and it was very stressful. And I remember saying, oh, okay, Lord, I just would really like a house that's near the train station so I can get around. 
and we live half a block from the train station. We have this lovely little house. We have the, you know, and I was like, oh, you heard that, <laughs> you know, but I didn't remember. I didn't sit down and say, dear Lord. I just kind of was, as we were rushing around looking at houses, I said, oh, Lord, that's what I really need. And yeah. he heard that. But Leanne has a comment. She goes, sometimes I am very drawn to prayer and it is a deep source of comfort, but sometimes it can feel scary to pray because it may feel as though prayers aren't answered or God is far away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's often a question is um, some people will say, well, I prayed and God didn't answer my prayer. <laughs> so what, what might we say when, especially for, for new believers or people are kind of, you know, exploring um, the spiritual discipline of prayer for themselves, um, especially, like I said, new people, um, how might we help them with that question? I guess we never know when God, uh, we can never say for sure that God uh, hears our prayers, but uh, the thing is, God don't always answer the prayer in our time, yeah. and, right? And that's hard uh, sometimes, and uh, I, I'll, I will admit that sometimes I've found that hard and say, oh, Lord, like, why and you know a prayer that i prayed maybe last year may not be answered till three or four years down the road but god see for me this is how, how i worked it out in my head is that god knows he sees he knows everything about us um, and he sees the big picture but god will answer our prayers if if our prayers are according to his will now that's that's how I look at it. <laughs> I, I agree with Gloria yeah. and what she said. I also know that my husband, we once upon a time took a, an alpha program. We started, uh, or he started a prayer journal. We each had a prayer journal. And he was totally surprised when he wrote down the things he prayed for. And then he saw where he um, actually did, the prayers were answered for him. Mm -hmm. And he tells that story often because often if we don't write down or aren't aware of what we're praying for, we may not even realize that the prayers have been answered. We just may forget that's true. That's yeah. really mm -hmm. what we ask for and when they are being answered. I keep a prayer journal from time to time. I will admit I'm not consistent, but I've, I've, I have a few prayer journals and sometimes I go back over them. And when I go back over them, I'm brought to tears because probably a prayer that I had prayed in one book got answered maybe in, in the next book. Uh, I don't know if this is appropriate, but being a Newfoundlander, Newfoundlanders like to tell stories. So I'm gonna share a little funny story with you. Is that okay? <laughs> yes, please. I'll just take a minute. So it was this guy, this is a little joke. It was this guy and he was traveling throughout um, all the churches anyway. Uh, throughout Canada and when he got to Newfoundland and of course there was pay phones and you probably heard this story it's pay phones in the back of the churches you know call to heaven one dollar call to heaven 50 cents call to heaven 25 cents and when he got to Newfoundland he was in this little church and it said by the pay phone call to heaven free and he said why is it that out here in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in a little church in Newfoundland, the call to heaven is free. And the guy said, it's a direct call from here, buddy. <laughs> uh. And Cherry here, we thought the South Shore of Nova Scotia was God's country. I think Newfoundland <laughs> is too. Yeah, that's uh, great. <laughs> wonderful country we're living in. What a wonderful <laughs> world. <laughs> well, and those prayers are free, that's for sure. It's the one thing that, you know, any parish, any Christian, any church leader, parishioner, layperson <laughs> can do. I mean, you know, sometimes we think, oh, we can't do much because we don't have a big budget or we don't have a big team to be behind it. I mean, this is something we can do in our neighborhood every day, driving through, walking through in the grocery store, like you say, at the mailbox. Um, and it's one of those free things. And, and I think it changes us and I think it changes um, the world around us, people around us, the neighborhood and God. God does here, yeah. I think, Laura, you had mentioned earlier about um, how, you know, people we encounter, um, 
may not be Christians, obviously. And, uh, and I think, and I think, Cherry, you had mentioned about kind of um, the, the, the power of prayer of, of encountering people with prayer. And I think it's one of the things that that research has shown is that even if folks wouldn't say that they're, um, they're engaged in a faith community, or they often say I'm spiritual, but not religious, many people would say that they pray or meditate or um, have um, of times of, of kind of peaceful mindfulness um, where they're hoping to connect some way with whether you know it's a higher power of some sort and I think it's one of our growing missional edges um, and I know Alpha uh, International has done quite a bit of work around this recognizing it's often the gift of um, the first one of the first gifts of someone who is discovering faith for the first time in Christianity um, and I think it's one of those places that I mean who doesn't want to have good good lovely kind words prayed over them. <laughs> I remember stopping outside the hospital one day and there was a lady who had um, a walker and, and um, a, a piece of luggage with her and she was weeping and people were just walking by in and out of the busy hospital here in Halifax. And, and I thought, my gosh, I can't, I can't keep on walking. This woman is crying her eyes out on the sidewalk um, and obviously in distress and so I, I stopped and we talked for a minute and she had shared with what was going on for her the sadness she had you know her story and and I said um, um would you be okay if I had a prayer with you right now and she said oh dear I would love it and and there we were standing on the sidewalk in this busy hospital um praying for her and and just just as we were finishing the car drove up to pick her up to take her back home and and you know I never saw her again and and, and I think you know if if, he did, if she said no I would say fine no problem like of course no I totally respect that um but she allowed me to to share that in in sacred words not fancy words you know I didn't have a prayer book with me <laughs> you know just words off the top of my head and you know and you, I always feel a little goofy and awkward sometimes I think this is not coming out the most grace-filled <laughs> poetic language here but I think people like that you care for them, even if they don't really understand prayer or what Christian faith is about. There's something about someone showing, like you said, um, Gloria, about being present to people, even sometimes if you don't have words, you know? Yeah. I've heard that elderly people say, uh, well, not only elderly people, but other people say, people really don't care how much you know. They want to know how much you care. Yeah, absolutely. We have a retired bishop here, Bishop Sue Moxley, um, and she always said um, that when people say, will you pray for me? She said, well, why don't we pray right now? Like, I'm not just going to take your name home and put it in my prayer list. I'm, I'm going to pray with you right now, just in case I forget. <laughs> I think that's good because sometimes let's face it people say will you pray for me and I don't get a chance to write it down and remember who, you know or put it in my phone <laughs> who I was like let's pray right now and would you be would you be comfortable and if they say no you know and I and I've done that a lot I, I've only had one person ever say no to me and this was a person who who had a, a real struggle with with the church and I said fine he said but you can pray you know for me privately he said I just don't want you to pray with me right now but over all the years that I've been a Christian and have been in leadership as a lay person and, and as clergy, I've never had anyone say, no, don't pray for me. Now I'm, you know, I'm, it's always a respectful prayer. It's not pushy, yeah. <laughs> nosy oh. kind of <laughs> prayer, but you know, I think, yeah, if we, if we, if we're able to minister to folks, that's powerful missional. Sure. Mm. Wow. We are almost out of time. But thank you so much. I feel so inspired. Thank you, everyone, for all your comments. There's so many comments we couldn't do justice to today. Thank you. And uh, this was a question about helping people access uh, this episode. If they're not friends with us, you can share it to them, as uh, Leanne was saying, and uh, by messengering it to them. But this will be available also on YouTube shortly once we edit it up and uh, get that out probably in the next day. Uh, so 
Yes, and yeah. we had problems sharing the live link over to our Diocesan uh, Nova Scotia P Prince Edward Island Facebook page. I will share the recording later, of course, as always. But also, Cherry has graciously provided us with the prayer booklet that they use to do their prayer caravan. You're welcome to use those prayers, adapt them for your own congregations. I'll post that shortly um, on all the sites that we can find that have had have carried this conversation today. And we want to say thank you to Cherry and to Gloria for sharing your stories and the inspiring example of prayer ministry in your communities it's been really wonderful today we appreciate it thank you so much yeah and thank you to, to god be the glory amen to that <laughs> thank you and so, those who sing pray twice so you know there <laughs> we you haven't go. got a prayer book <laughs> what do we have next week neil well we're going to continue with our prayer theme for the next couple of weeks as we lead up towards Pentecost so come again and we'll be talking about prayer and uh, I think it's going to be a very fruitful and rich uh, conversation certainly if today is anything to go by it will be very rich thank you both so much I, I feel so encouraged today uh, by our conversation and I hope Me all too. our guests as well so this has been Pew and Beyond for May it's incredible and uh, may the fourth be with you. I finally figured that out. May the fourth be with you. <laughs> and we will be here next week. Uh, same time, same place. Please join us. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. God bless you.